afternoon, everyone. I hope everyone is well. My name is Jeannie Allen. I am the founder and CEO of the Center for Education Reform, and it's my pleasure to welcome you to Why America Part 7, a look at Thanksgiving and our very first government. Welcome uh, to especially to our teachers and students who are joining us today. Uh, probably from your homes, most of you. We're so glad that you're here to learn with us. So today we're taking a look at Thanksgiving direct from Plymouth, Massachusetts, where 400 years ago, the Mayflower landed and pilgrims came ashore. Today we're joined by pilgrim leader William Brewster himself, Jerry Pereira from the 400th organization at the house on the grounds where the first Thanksgiving actually occurred, and some of you thought it was just about eating, and Dr. Paul J. Lee from the Plymouth Rock Foundation. They'll be sharing a lot with us today about that first Thanksgiving, the Mayflower Compact, and our first government charter, which is how we all got to where we are today, and the path from Plymouth to the founding of our country and the U.S. Constitution. But before we go to the people, we're going to go live uh, to Dr. J. Lee on the ground in Plymouth, Massachusetts at Plymouth Rock for a short video that he just taped this morning. So if we can cue that video, friends and colleagues, um, let's do that. And while you're waiting for that, let me just also remind you um, that uh, Why America also makes it possible for teachers to not only get continuing education credit, but we have a master recognition prize and a student contest. So let me just talk to the students out there or those of you who have students while we're getting that video. And we want to make sure that you all are um, looking at our website at whyamerica.edreform.com for that information. The National Monument to the Forefathers here in Plymouth, Massachusetts, constructed over a period of 30 years, was completed in 1889. Its central figure of faith reaches high to the sky she points toward the heaven because of the pilgrim's relationship to God. She holds a Bible, the Geneva Bible, which they brought here to the new world. Here, this statue illustrates for us both religious and civil liberty, the liberty of conscience to which the pilgrims wanted to come. And though those two concepts of internal religious and external civil liberty would take two centuries to develop here in America, the seeds of those truths came on the Mayflower with this Pilgrim Leiden congregation. This monument is ornate, combining from the architecture of Hammett Billings, symbols from the Bible and from the history of the pilgrims themselves. Four seated figures surround faith at her feet. Morality, how they drew their standards of right and wrong from the Bible. Law, how they implemented those as the rule of law in their society. And also education, how they taught their children. And liberty, here the demonstration that civil liberty is one of those values we cherish in America. This monument ornately describes the roots of those things that came with the pilgrims on the Mayflower. Now, in the hold of the Mayflower were many things. There were barrels of food. There were barrels of supplies that they would bring here. But we like to think of it this way here in Plymouth, that the most precious cargo brought by these pilgrims, who were called pilgrims many years later, were the ideas they held in their hearts. The ideas, not just from that congregation, but the ideas that they felt they would express into a commonwealth, a commonwealth where they would be under the rule of law, where the church would not rule the state and the state would not rule the church. This ornate monument depicts why these values should be portrayed and given to our children today. We need to know where the ideas of liberty came from. And they did come from a small group of people on a boat. They were never numerous, they were never wealthy, and they never wanted to be honored themselves. And yet we look back today and can see in hindsight how valuable many of their ideas were. From their peaceful intent with the natives to their ideas on how to be productive economically and in every other area of their society, Looking back at this monument, 
It symbolizes the values and the truths brought by this group, now today known as pilgrims. And as William Bradford said about their beginnings and their impact, he said this, as one small candle may light a thousand, so the light here kindled hath shone unto many, yea, in some sort to our whole nation. Let the glorious name of Jehovah have all the praise. One of the seated statues around faith is called education. And here this pilgrim mother is pointing out truth in the book of knowledge. She's wearing a laurel wreath, symbolizing victory while young. What is this book of knowledge? While the Bible was the main text from which pilgrim mothers would have taught their children the values of life, the pilgrims themselves brought 400 volumes of books on the Mayflower itself. Literacy and learning was very important to them. Many of these books were in five different languages. Even William Bradford studied Hebrew by candlelight. They wanted to hand down to their children the things they felt were the most valuable for that future generation. That's why on one side is a mother and child, a small statuette. She's holding a Bible and her daughter's holding a scroll. On the other side is a grandfather with the Bible at his feet, the open 10 commandments, and a world. You see, these pilgrims came here and they believed very strongly that it was a parent's responsibility to pass on to their children the things they thought were most valuable to preserve as the reason they came here to the new world. And the grandparents were ones who would take great interest in influencing their children and grandchildren. So today in America, we must recognize the family is so important in handing down those values of liberty of conscience. The pilgrims could never have believed what those values would become in American history. They couldn't conceive it. But after decades and even centuries, we can now look back and see that those values that have been preserved through the education of the next generation and those who were tutors that would help those parents to do it is very, very important. Those values need to be preserved. We see it now in hindsight, which is 2020. And now I'm so happy to turn over the program to a pilgrim in, uh, at least through an interpreter, uh, William Brewster, Rich Howell playing William Brewster of the founding fathers, our forefathers um, in Plymouth. And I'm just gonna ask as he takes over the stage, if you'll share with us why, um, in your own words, you came, why uh, you're here. So take it away. Thank you, Mr. Brewster. Greetings. I am William Brewster. I am the elder of a church that gathered first in Scrooby so long ago. I was also a bailiff in Scrooby, as was my father, to the Archbishop of York. Very strange days at that time. We were a group that were numbered by our detractors known as separatists. It was a name we never chosen for ourselves. And like our brethren, the Puritans, who were also given a name they hadn't chosen, we were quite often put together, but we had some differences. We believed in reforming the church, at that time, the Church of England, uh, after breaking away from the Church of Rome, the Roman Catholic Church. We strongly believed that man had to read the gospel for himself. And that is why we stuck very close to our Bible, the Geneva Bible, the first Bible completely translated in English after many years, and in some cases, much longer of work. It also led to our form of governance in a way. Being Englishmen, we were used to rights under Magna Carta and others as well. And after a while, hard times hit. Our Queen Elizabeth had passed in the early part of the century, and she was replaced soon by King James the Sixth of Scotland, soon to become King James the First of England. Around that time, the Archbishop of York, who had been somewhat friendly to us and did not molest our gatherings at the church, died, and he was replaced by a much less tolerant and less forgiving, more relentless man. At that point, we had decided we needed to remove and we had planned within a year 
1607 to do such in Holland. And unfortunately we were betrayed. And then we were imprisoned in Boston and nearby Lincolnshire. After a while we were freed. And then we decided to follow other congregations similar to ours. Many came from our areas in, in Nottinghamshire and in Yorkshire and in Lincolnshire and settled in the Netherlands. I had been familiar with them. I had been a secretary to a former diplomat, William Davison, who was a key advisor and, and servant to Her Majesty uh, Queen Elizabeth. And when we moved there, we discovered that we were going to settle in Amsterdam. After settling in Amsterdam, there was a schism within the communities of our brethren there. And we decided as our congregation from school, we would remove to Leiden. Unfortunately, our master, the learned Reverend Richard Clifton, too old to move with us. And at that point, the other beloved Reverend John Robertson had taken over. This was during the times of the troubles in, in Holland. And they were in the middle of a truce and he became known as the 80 years war. And that truce was about to be broken and the Spanish threatening at any point. Our lives were in bigger mortal danger than they ever would have been in England, even with the Stuarts. We decided to remove. In England, providentially, men there had decided that they wanted to help settle further the colonies in North America, one being settled in Virginia and the southern parts of Virginia and another to be settled in the northern parts. We accepted this readily and we embarked. We were the largest number in the ship. We had two initially, but one ship unfortunately did not make it. Uh, and then we had to pull back to the harbor twice and then we sailed. Many different hardships along the way on our ship, the Mayflower. However, we were blown off course and we ended up much further north than we intended, a place called Cape Cod. At that point, not only was the patent not permissible there, but the company that had jurisdiction there was in the middle of disillusion and reformation. So according to a letter that our minister, John Robinson had sent, and with good advice, we decided to form a body politic amongst ourselves. And that body politic, we put into words. I just wanna read them for you now. In the name of God, amen. We whose names are underwritten, the loyal subjects of our dread sovereign, Lord King James, by ye grace of God in Great Britain, France, Ireland, King, defender of ye faith, and having undertaken for ye glory of God and advancement of ye Christian faith and honor of our king and country, a voyage to plant ye first colony in ye northern parts of Virginia. Do by these presents solemnly and mutually in ye preference of God and one another covenant and combine ourselves together in a civil body politic for our better ordering and preservation and furtherance of the ends aforesaid, and by virtue hereof to enact, constitute, and frame such just and equal laws, ordinances, acts, and constitutions and offices from time to time, as shall be thought most meet and convenient for ye general good of ye colony, unto which we promise all due submission and obedience. It witness whereof we have hereunder subscribed our names at Cape Cod, 11th of November, in the year of ye reign of our sovereign Lord King James of England, France, Ireland, the 18th, and of Scotland, the 54th, Anno Domini, 1620. That was where the body for where we were going to settle was going to be governed. A month later, exactly, we landed in the shores. Some of our men of Plymouth found a village that had been abandoned many years earlier by the natives. We brought our ship forward. And then we settled there in this great land. And there, our story continued. Thank you so much, Pilgrim William Brewster. Let's bring back in your colleague uh, for the next part of our discussion. So tell us, what uh, when you think about what you just heard from Mr. Brewster, um, what would you say to teachers and students about how best they can understand this experience? Well, one of the things to recognize is that uh, great things can happen from very small beginnings. Every young person and student can recognize that a small act of kindness, a small act of doing things that are right, sometimes unnoticed, uh, sometimes when you least expect it, and yet it can go a long way. So it was with the pilgrims. Their intent was merely to come here to live out their faith peacefully. Uh, they wanted to form a commonwealth. 
to be able to do that. They set up a government like the Mayflower Compact that uh, would be the rule of law that would treat people equally, having no idea how that small step would become such a large wake behind what they did. And that's why I think that uh, the Pilgrim story is so unique. Uh, it's such a small group of people and half their number die the first winter. Uh, very few of them continue on. Think of it this way. Uh, it's one of the first explorations in history at that time period where people came as families. Women and children came on the Mayflower. People didn't travel that way uh, normally. And you think 18 adult women were on the Mayflower. And think of this, three of them got on board more than six months pregnant. Therefore, they would give birth uh, to those children. And they had all kinds of experiences. One gave birth in the middle of an ocean, named him Oceanus. Another one had a stillborn in Provincetown Harbor. And a third gave birth, and that son, Peregrine, lived to be 84 years of age, dying in 1704. So their experiences were greatly varied, but only four adult women were left alive by the time of that fall in their first harvest festival. So I think we can look back and we can say, even though they gave great sacrifice, even though so many of them even lost their lives and never saw the fruit of what they really wanted, we look back today and see heroics in their character, determination, perseverance, even helping one another at the risk of their own lives during that first great sickness. And it's very applicable to many of the challenges we face today. I think that story is very relevant to individuals today in the classroom. Well, and, I, and, I, and I'd like to also just um, throw out one more question before we add Jerry to the conversation. Welcome, Jerry. Um, I'd love for you all to address because uh, at the Center for Education Reform, we don't think you um, leave any stone unturned. And uh, this is a hot issue. And so, and so coming from your unique perspectives and with teachers out there, um, what do you say to people who question why uh, there was a necessity to come here? And how do you address um, the sort of where, where it brought us today? Why should we look back and say that was good? And how do we um, mitigate the complaints that maybe things weren't always super peaceful? Sure, and I think that no matter what uh, event you look at in history, there are good things and there are difficult things. There are challenges. Things don't always go right. Uh, I look at it this way, in every event that's ever taken place, you're going to have problems because you have people. But also what we need to do is go back and look at the most valuable things. The intent the pilgrims came to live in peace. Does that mean they lived perfectly with the natives? Of course not. Uh, there were fault on both sides. There were issues that looking back on hindsight, you say, gee, I wish they did this differently or did something else differently. But one of the things to look at is the silver lining in history. When you can see a thread of redemption, things to learn from in our past. These were the most peace-loving people that came. Uh, that doesn't mean they did everything perfectly, far from it. At the same time, when you look at their legacy for generations, we looked back and saw the character here. And also we look at it and we honor those natives which they uh, made peace with because without their help, they would never would have survived. And so it's a two-way street. And what, a, what an example today to lift up the highest values and say, if we really do look past our differences, if we really do join together for the common good, why we can go so much further than to simply emphasize our differences and some of the conflicts. And Jerry, let me bring you in now again. Jerry Pereira, for those of you just joining us, is from the organization 400.org. And uh, he's on the grounds where the first Thanksgiving actually occurred. I wonder if you can uh, address the concept as we all gather next week, some of us, unfortunately, in more limited circumstances, what do we need to know, particularly coming out of what um, Mr. Jaley was just talking about, this, this difficulty, this challenges, the tension we've all just come out of with teachers and schools trying to help their students make sense of government, kids, you out, you out there as well. Um, why is it important that there's, there was this new government that was started there? And what, do we, what did we take? And what do we still have 
from those 400 years ago. Well, Janine, it's, uh, it's a delight to be with you. Thank you for this invitation. Uh, yes, uh, we are here at um, sort of the epicenter of this season, uh, and it's, uh, it's, it's really great to be with you from Plymouth. Um, let me, first of all, um, maybe put, put things into perspective of, of my story. I'm a Sri Lankan by, by birth. So when uh, my father brought me here to this nation, uh, he talked about a land of freedom. And, uh, you know, you don't get that as a young boy, but as you, as you grow up in America, as you're educated in America, as I was, you start asking the questions, what is this freedom about? And uh, it brought me back to the Pilgrim story, uh, just being living here in the proximity of Plymouth. So it, it brings me back to the Pilgrim story and I start asking the questions, you know, how did this freedom in our nation come about? How did our government come about? And I, I have come across uh, the, the, the Mayflower Compact as that first charter. And it was simply drawn up as Paul has illustrated by a group of families. And it represented the first seed of a self-governing document. And uh, at this site where we're at, uh, it's a wonderful place to be because you experience it real time. Uh, it's the site of the first home uh, of, that the Pilgrims built in, in uh, 1621. It's a site of the first uh, representative election in the Western Hemisphere. They, they chose a leader. Here's, a, here's the, the practicum of what Paul was talking about uh, as an agreement they chartered among themselves to even vote to elect someone. Uh, and it's interesting because both the pilgrims, the Leiden congregation as we know them, and the strangers were able to sign this document, this charter, this compact, uh, which then produced uh, uh, a mutually beneficial um, colony, the seeds of an early colony. And the third important thing that happened here at Ground Zero, this epicenter, is there was a peace treaty signed with the natives. Well documented, uh, Bradford recounts it, we have the language of that treaty. And I often think of it this way, Janine, it's not a treaty between the, the French and the English. It's not a treaty between the Dutch and the, and the Swiss. Um, this is a treaty between two very different civilizations, and that's very unique. And as, as Paul had, had mentioned, it, it's the longest lasting peace treaty in American history. And it's something that we look to celebrate here in Plymouth. It, it really is um, exciting and interesting. And um, what you're speaking to from the perspective both of having come here for freedom, uh, like my uh, father did as well from another country, as well as so many of us, um, how important it is to really understand intent, right? And I think we can also learn a lot through the original letters and writings that were left behind. I know I'm, I'm plowing through David McCullough's The Pioneers now and realizing that so much of what we hear is not necessarily based in fact, yet he poured over letters that people wrote each other you know, a few hundred year, couple of hundred years later, not even about their journey westward. That's a whole nother um, area. So um, let me bring into our conversation. We love to have educators as part of the work we're doing to both talk as well as challenge um, our speakers. So first I'm gonna bring in Dr. Susan DeMoss from Christian Heritage Academies in Oklahoma to talk a little bit about the Pilgrims and the Mayflower story from an educator's perspective. And then um, we're going to ask Dr. DeMoss to speak. And then also we have a panel kind of reactions from Lauren Statton from the Washington Latin School, who's been with us before, and Tara Wicker from Heritage Academy in Ohio. So we have D.C., Ohio, uh, excuse me, D.C., Idaho, Oklahoma, Massachusetts, and of course the nation represented. And from our um, attendees, you all represent um, another 20 states, which is super exciting. So um, let me hand it over to you, Dr. DeMoss. I'm from Christian Heritage Academy, and we do teach the seven principles of our government as we think, learn to think governmentally, not only to our faculty and staff, but to our students. One of the things that you can learn from the Pilgrim story is about character. First, it's who is God, how they viewed God and who God was framed their framework of how they viewed the world. 
because it was the character of the pilgrims. They weren't perfect people. Um, but you do see a direct contrast between the character of the pilgrims when they came over in 1620 and can, versus what happened in Jamestown earlier. Um, while Jamestown and, um, settlers came for wealth or perhaps um, they didn't come as family units, so their view of the family was different, the pilgrims came as family units. And even those that didn't come with a family were attached to a family. And the purpose for the pilgrims was really for religious freedom. Dr. DeMoss, let me just jump in here real quick because I want to make sure that um, we uh, jump, pull Lawrence and Tara in here as well. So your Christian school, you're coming from a Christian perspective and you, and you pull certain things out of the pilgrims experience. Lawrence, you're representing you and Tara, both of public schools. Um, how do you envision this and how do you teach, um, and share some of these, some of the values and some of the lessons learned. And I want to make sure that um, Pilgrim William Brewster and um, Mr. Jaylay and, and Jerry Pereira come in as well. Well, I guess uh, speaking from my perspective, teaching in uh, Washington, D.C., uh, the values that we uh, instill are the importance of self-government uh, and talking and exploring how the Mayflower Compact is a foundational document in the uh, founding story of the United States and how it eventually leads to the government, the principles of self-government that are in both the Declaration of Independence and the Constitution. And the idea that, you know, the pilgrims came together to form a compact of their own accord, that's really important to the foundation of the United States. This idea that of the consent of the governed, I mean, that's an idea that goes back to John Locke, uh, that's an idea that is echoed in uh, Jefferson's Declaration of Independence, and it's an idea that is echoed in the U.S. Constitution. So the way I frame it is that the Mayflower Compact is really important in expressing the idea of self-government, that government gets its power from the people and the consent of the governed, in that it is a compact which we, the people, come together to uh, mutually agree that these are the set of rules we agree to live by. Tara, what are your thoughts about that? Uh, I think that we um, we approach things in a similar way. We've had a lot of discussions in the last couple of weeks, especially about the role of government and um, what is appropriate, what's not appropriate, some of the debate that's going on in the country right now from COVID to election, you know, you name it, we've talked about it. And, um, and, and we've centered a lot of our discussions about the uh, liberty, personal liberty, personal freedom, um, why the constitution was written the way it was written, why, you know, where these ideas came from um, and that kind of thing, so. That's great. Uh, Mr. Pereira, Jerry, would you like to address some of what you're hearing? Sure. Um, you know, um, it's, there's always, uh, after 400 years, I ask myself the question, you know, where is the truth in all of this? Where do we find the truth? And I've got to rely on going back to some primary sources. And I think that's so important in the education process. Where are we digging to find these jewels and gems of truth that, are, that is a part of our American heritage. So um, uh, we're gonna post a, an article on our website, which gives you a link to many of the sources that uh, I've benefited from, as well as other education educators. And these are the primary sources. And, and we had a, sorry, Jeannie, go ahead, please. Go ahead. No, I was gonna say, we, we had a great question and, and I wanna go back because there were two groups of individuals on the Mayflower, am I correct? There were uh, the, the family-based uh, individuals who were coming for freedom of religion purposes. And then there was a, a little bit of a, of a rowdier group, if, uh, if I could use a word. Uh, they were, um, was there not some, is mutiny too strong of a word? Or, or was there some disagreements that everybody then had to say, hang on guys, we've got a little bit of talking here to do. Um, if someone could address uh, that, that would be fantastic. Sure. 
I'd be glad to. Um, I think that to one of the things you recognize is that when the pilgrims got on that ship, you're correct, there were some from the Leiden congregation called separatists, and there were others that had come that were strangers. They were hired. Um, one was a military commander hired, other were the keepers of the barrels and others that were hired to come there. And when they had disagreements, one of the major reasons they had a disagreement in England, the uh, king was the head of the church. And so you had a state church that was uh, enforcing religious belief. And then when you had this congregation on board the Mayflower coming across, when they were not under their original patent that had been formed in England, it was natural for this minority group to think, hey, we're going to have to be governed by the church. Now we're going to have a church state. If we're not members of that church, we're going to be persecuted. We're not going to have a full say. And when that talk of mutiny or going off on their own took place after they realized they were outside their patent and we're going to settle on Cape Cod, I think it's the genius of their pastor, John Robinson, who had very much enlarged views of civil government that they drew up a Mayflower Compact where you did not have to be a member of the church to vote in the Commonwealth. Everyone was equal under the law. And of course, at that context, it was all the males, head of their households, and individuals who were to vote. So that was, in right there, produced a unity that everyone was going to have an equal say in the laws. The church was not going to rule, and neither was the state in the sense of being over the church. But instead, it would be the rule of law. And that's a legacy we've had in America. And um, and and is there is there a um, what's the critical point at which the tribe then becomes involved? And and how are how is first contact made? What what is the approach? How do they get involved? Is it and and there's and let's there's some. There's some questions out there as to uh, were they truly invited? Uh, was this a was this a mutually beneficial meeting? Uh, how did that develop? I think that's something that a lot of us uh, always think. And as we look through what we have presented to us, what is out there factually that from both sides show that this was what, how that meeting occurred? And I think when yeah, go ahead. Let me before you answer that, and I want and I want you, um, our Plymouth Rock people and and the educators as well, to address this. I think that's very important. I also want to um, be unabashedly direct with everyone on this um, event, including some of our friends in the chat, um, because the reality is that we can pull apart every single minute thirty second behavior in our 400 years of history and feel like nothing matters. And yet our children are out there looking at us as adults, asking us to unite, asking to understand where we came from, why we're here, but more importantly, what we can do with it. And so at CER, we're not about pounding our chest and saying, oh, how bad everything is. What we want to do is amplify as we have here, as we have with presidents in the past, what is it we can learn from the pilgrim experience? I've heard perseverance. I've heard determination. I've heard self-sacrifice, all very non-secular themes, by the way. Some came from religion. By the way, religion is in our Declaration of Independence, whether it's one's, one's, one's flavor or not. The reality is we have a nation that was created out of the Mayflower Compact, out of the pil pilgrims, that allows allows and fosters diversity. So I'm just putting a squash on on the people out there who think this is going to be a conversation about how bad people are. We don't believe that. The majority of Americans believe don't believe that. And we're going to talk to the educators out there who actually believe we have something not only to learn from history, but that our children need us to help them learn how we truly can be that more perfect union. So with that said, jump in. Uh, yeah, I, on that itself, I just want to go back to what was said earlier. Um, I'm going to come out of character because I think it wouldn't make sense for me to stay in character at this point. Um, as far as perfect people go, I've always found that to be a bit of a canard because um, it doesn't really enter into the conversation. 
Uh, human beings are human beings, as we've talked about, and things do happen. But as far as what happened here, when they came here, they came here to settle. They didn't come here to conquer. Um, with first contact, they accidentally taken some food that they thought was for the taking and found out it wasn't. Um, and then obviously the people who owned the food didn't like it. And they were used to dealing with rogue Englishmen, uh, meaning the sailors. that oh, didn't act quite like proper Englishmen. And that's what their, their, their context was. They did try to return it, by the way. Um, as far as Jamestown goes, I, I don't think we should fall into the same trap that we fall into with Plymouth and say, okay, you know, Jamestown, yes, it was very different, no question about it. Um, but Jamestown provided a lot of great things as well. The first legislative assembly in 1619 came out of Jamestown. What made Plymouth different and why this colony in, in, in um, Plymouth and later on Massachusetts Bay developed the way it did was because of the, of the godly character of the people here, the particular way they governed themselves. They were the majority here. Uh, that's why the compact was written. The patent didn't just no longer have any force. The company itself, as I indicated earlier in character, was in transformation. So they had to do a couple of different things. And as far as what we want for a primary source, I would, I would encourage every uh, educator, parent, anybody on this call, On Plymouth Plantation is beyond a regular diary. It is one of the finest, if not in my opinion, the finest chronicle on American life I have ever written. And I've read them all, not all of them, I've read most of them throughout the different eras. And it explains exactly well. He, he, he writes from his perspective. However, he is exceedingly fair and he is exceedingly uh, generous in giving time to everybody involved in the story. And I think right there, you can start. Michael, uh, if I could uh, uh, pitch in a little bit on, on really what your, some of the questions you raised and what did, what did this uh, look like here in 1620? The, the latter part of 1620. The, the timeline is really uh, remarkable because, uh, as you know, they landed in December of 1620. And by April 1, we have a record of this treaty between two nations, which then the next fall season, that harvest festival, we know as a Thanksgiving, a time of unity. And, you know, the, the record describes there are 90 braves and their families feasting for several days. So that puts the numbers well into the hundreds. So, you know, that was, uh, the, the timeline is amazing. From December of their landing through the next fall, they develop a relationship. And in speaking with uh, several of the native First Nation peoples, relationship is a very key factor in their understanding. And these relationships that were developed and built were certainly not of hostility, otherwise they wouldn't have us feasted together. And, and this little band of families surviving after a winter, a harrowing winter, with, a, with, a, with the Wampanoag Nation surrounding them. And the Wampanoag Nation stretched from Southern Maine to Connecticut. It, it was a vast nation. They could have easily wiped out the, these uh, families easily if they were at war or if they were warring or the intent. I think, Janine, you're, you had an operative word, the intent, that's, that's just beautiful. And you can see the intentions that happens through this timeline of a gathering of 90 braves and their families feasting together for three to four days, having recreational games and, and developing a relationship that would be uh, 50 years of incredible uh, peace and unity together. I just think well, Lark thing real quickly is the fact that um, when in 1614, when Thomas Hunt came uh, trading from England uh, and uh, in this area, he um, tricked 22 natives to go on board, put them in chains and took them away as slaves, mistreated the natives. That's why they fired upon the pilgrims when they arrived on Cape Cod. They had every reason to do that. This was a tall order for this small group of church and strangers to come and to overcome the wrongs that had already been done to the natives. The natives had every reason to defend themselves. They had every reason to distrust the English that came on this boat. When they saw them come as families, they must have been tempered that this was a different intent. Without that alliance that took place in late March 
there would have been uh, no Thanksgiving in the fall. And also, it's important to note that um, when one of the young boys in the plantation ran away, and the tribe that had been specifically wrong, the Nosset on Cape Cod, picked up this boy, they went down and when they found out that uh, there was a hundred year old woman who had lost her sons and grandsons that had been stolen, Bradford takes the opportunity to apologize on behalf of his race for the mistreatment. That's not gonna solve everything, but it's important to note that if you don't have the Alliance and if you don't have the apology, you probably don't have that three day festival. Lawrence and Tara, um, uh, you're the uh, teachers with us. Can you um, can you talk a little bit about how you present? Uh, obviously, those are critical points that Paul uh, just made. Um, you know, and we've seen this over and over again. Sometimes apologies are the way to move forward. Sometimes they don't help. But at the end of the day, there's there's a you don't come and celebrate with people unless you have a basis for doing it in a mutually supportive way of each other. So I'd love to hear your take as teachers on that aspect of it. One of the things that we talk about um, quite often is we really try hard to avoid the trap of um, judging what happened 100, 200, 300, 400 years ago by the moral understanding that we have today, that, the, that it's really a mistake because the people of the past are never gonna win. And because their understanding in life was different. And so that's something that we talk about it in, in our literature discussions, we talk about in our, in our civics discussions. Um, we talk about that idea often though, that you know, yes, this thing, it was horrible. This was a horrible event. Um, but then let's talk about how did we, how do we move on from it? How, did, what, what came from it? Um, rather than focusing on the awful parts of humanity, because as has been stated, we are all human and our forefathers were all human. That's right. So when that's you how horrible event, you were not talking about per se, the founding, you were saying if there no, were just anything in particular. Lawrence, you know, I want to bring you in too on that. We had that discussion um, in our very first Why America program this year about um, the president's neighborhood. And in the president's neighborhood right outside where many of us are um, is Lafayette Park, which is where people forever have protested and demonstrated and made their voice heard very peacefully, sometimes with an earshot of the president. And there's the statue of Andrew Jack, and we've taken kids through there in our non-virtual Why America event and learned about Rochambeau and Lafayette. And there's the, there's the statue in the middle of Andrew Jackson. And Lawrence, you made a comment that I'd love you to share about that, given what was going on at the time, which was the summer and the challenges so many people were feeling about racism. Um, well, if I, if I recall that, that conversation correctly, it's, it's been a while. Um, and I guess I can re relate this back to the current discussion on the Mayflower Compact. One of the things I try to uh, instill in my classroom is, you know, a, a degree of historical empathy. You know, understanding the perspective of, you know, the individuals at the time. Uh, and, and the challenge is, we do have the benefit of, you know, in, in regards to the uh, the Mayflower Compact now, 400 years of hindsight. Uh, and and the, the, the approach I take with my students is it is okay to acknowledge the wrongs that were done. And, and you have to do that as part of gaining that historical perspective. But it's also important to understand that the story of the United States is ultimately the story of how we try to become a more perfect union. It's not perfect. It never has been. And who knows if we ever do get to that ultimate ideal. But the ultimate story is that, you know, step by step, uh, we are trying to get there. 
And, you know, there are good moments in, in there are some very proud moments in the American story where we've come real close to getting there. And there have been moments where there have been challenges and setbacks. And as historians, you know, it's important to talk about those and have those challenging conversations with students and, you know, hear their perspectives and honor their perspectives. But ultimately, uh, I would hope that as, as educators, you know, we try to recognize that the story of the country is we are trying to become a more perfect union. And, you know, the Mayflower Compact is one of those foundational documents that helps us on that road to becoming a more perfect union. And, and I want to bring Dr. Oh, yeah. DeMille uh, for a moment. Wow. As well. And before I do, I just want to by saying that there are many, many different philosophies, different ways to educate and different um, views on how we do education. Um, but at the heart of what you just said, Lawrence, as well about that more perfect union is we get to have this discussion. And so there's two things I want to share that I'm hoping that in our work in 28 years, I've learned almost 28 years that I hope and, and know that many of the educators who keep coming to these, it's why you do. It's first and foremost that we can we could be alive for 200 years and we'll never fully understand history. I don't know anyone here or on the call, on the on the on the event, or or the people who spend their lives doing history that could possibly read every single thing available and understand it, which is why we rely on credible historians that don't just publish books on Amazon. Um, but secondly, we should wade through those things and look for and understand that exact premise that Lawrence just talked about, Dr. Staten just talked about, which is we're not, we're not infallible. And the whole point is where can we be in a country that you could actually do what we're talking about move forward and learn. And so Dr. DeMoss, with that in mind, when you speak to your students and when you teach people, how do you help them understand? Let's just get back to very simple basics. Thanksgiving. What is Thanksgiving about? Why do we get together and what are we doing? Why should we celebrate this nation? Because after all, it is a celebration of this nation. Yes. And I I, I saw that one person had asked the question about the dissenters. The truth was we did, we, when we, when it, when in 1620, there were dissenters on the Mayflower as well as the pilgrims, right? And um, that everybody believed the same way. But I think it's a testimony that they elected Bradford so for so many terms. The idea of his character mattered. The leadership of character mattered in that character still matters in leadership today. What was Bradford's character that mattered? The character of the Indians, Massasoit was a good man. And we know that we see when Edward Winslow, when he went to help Massasoit when he was sick and he, Edward Winslow was not a doctor by trade, but he went and helped him. And after he helped him and Massasoit really thought he was going to die, Massasoit said, I now know that the English are my friends and I love them. So it wasn't just this animosity and understanding that we can be different, but what unifies us is internal. Externally, we may be very different, and but what unifies us is the internal things. And that's the idea of character. And so what are we thankful for? Well, first of all, the pilgrims were thankful for life. Oh my goodness, they were thankful for life. One of the greatest poems that we share is Five Kernels of Corn. That's a beautiful piece of literature that kids can read about how they were, I mean, they were starving and just what five kernels of corn meant. We celebrate even just having five kernels of corn to eat. It's not that we have to have an abundance of food and gluttony, but just what are we really thankful for? Even when it's really hard, we're thankful for family. We're thankful for shelter. It took them so much time. They came in the winter. They were off schedule, right? They've been blown off course. They shouldn't have been there in November. That's not how they had planned it. But you know what? We could be thankful for things that don't work out the way we thought and still see good in it, 
right? And even the provision of the corn on Corn Hill or just the stream of water and fresh water in that area where there was no fresh water and how they found that Pilgrim Spring. And when we take our kids to visit every spring, every, uh, we take our seniors every um, spring in May to go back and see it. We have our kids still drink, get down on their hands and knees and drink from that spring. And the idea of, our, what does fresh water mean? So much of the world doesn't even have water. And the pilgrims were thankful for water when they arrived too. And just what does that look like? And having to work together to help the community. Everyone pitched in to help build those homes together. And what can we do in our nation now? And how people had different customs. The pilgrims had certain foods that they brought, but the Native Americans had different foods they brought and everybody came together. And so I think embracing diversity in that and understanding what does it mean to be a nation it doesn't mean uniformity. Un union does not mean uniformity. A United States does not mean uniformity. It means united upon a certain group of law. And that's why we go back to, we're thankful for a republic and a republic came straight out of the Mayflower Compact because it was ruled by law, not people's opinions or even just preferences, but here's the governing set of laws that we're gonna rule from. So those are some ideas. Excuse me, thank you so much. And as we begin to close down and give people a lot of food for thought, can we just go sort of around the room, if you will, and maybe um, give uh, the folks on the call and in our meeting today, and thank you all so much for joining us. Again, all the previous sessions, whyamerica.edreform.com um, on all sorts of matters and exciting ones coming up in December and January about inaugurations and um, looking forward to, to, new, to, to new people. So, um, and how we all can continue to work towards a more perfect union. So let's go around and I'd love to um, have you all share maybe something you think is missing that educators or students today and next week can take to their classrooms, wherever they are, or to their home at the dining room table or the kitchen table or wherever. I think one of the things that we could uh, emphasize is what we have in common. The things that are unifying, as Dr. DeMoss emphasized, uh, the internal ideas. We want love. We want unity. We want harmony. We want respect for one another. We want uh, individuals to be gracious, to have manners, to uh, to not put people down, to not constantly turn every disagreement into hatred, uh, to not divide and be divisive. And I think that the little snapshot of the Pilgrim story can help us to see clues and how we can do that and to center on the unifying themes of what is best for all. And that's going to require us to give up some things that we might have the better good. Families can do that around the dinner table, even if it's just their family or if it's individuals on a Zoom call or families that aren't able to get together this year, what is it we're thankful for? How do we give thanks to God for bringing us together in spite of our differences and how we can pursue those? I think the Pilgrim story is a great place to begin along with the native story right in parallel to it. And I love, and I love that you focused, uh, the, the one of the statues was about education, which is another piece that we have to come back to. They came also for education. Thank you. Tara? Um, I, I find that today in the, my students today, I, I teach middle school students. Uh, my students today are stressed. They are anxious. They are wondering. Um, some really are struggling. Uh, we focus today on the idea of gratitude and um, we put up a poster in the hallway with uh, what we were grateful for and we made a goal that we were going to um, say something different every day until Christmas that we were in school. And we've already had several students who are not in my class during that period who have come and added to it already and so I think that as a focus you know we can't control a lot of things in our world right now but we can certainly control our perspective and we can certainly help those that we teach and those that we 
inspire. Um, we can help them see a different perspective as well through gratitude, I think. Thank you. What one thing we're missing that we want to tell people or share with them and suggest? As, as an educator, one of the things I try to, um, I hope people take away at, from my class and, you know, from these sessions is how incredibly fragile yet how incredibly special this experiment in self-government is. Um, civic responsibility and civic duty it is so fundamental to who we are as a people and as a country. I, I think one of my favorite personal quotes uh, from Dr. Benjamin Franklin is someone asked him, what form of government do we have? And Franklin says, a republic if you can keep it. So I, I would hope that you know, people take away that this experiment in self-government is, is fragile and, and is worth protecting, it's worth defending, it's worth challenging, but it's, it's worth fighting for. Uh, and we as Americans have a responsibility, whether it's serving in the military or whether it's um, voting or participating in, in a jury, uh, we have a responsibility as Americans to protect it and care for it and, and try to continue that journey that begins, you know, 400 years ago uh, into becoming a more perfect union. So I, I hope the takeaway is that this experiment called America is both special and fragile and it is worth protecting and fighting for. And I love uh, the challenge and challenging um, challenge with data and challenge with reality and um, make sure that you have, you have, you have it all. Jerry and then Pilgrim, William Brewster and then Michael, excuse me, my colleague at CER, did I preclude you? No, no, I was going to say uh, Jerry, then Mr. Brewster. <laughs> so perfect. Great. No, I, I think, um, I think, uh, you know, in America, we can certainly in this environment of a global pandemic, and all of with what's going on, America in America, it's it's great that we can have the um, this season of Thanksgiving and celebrate this uh, uh, holiday. The whole world looks at Thanksgiving in a different as a, in a perspective through an American perspective. I would like to think that we can be intentional this Thanksgiving about how we view this season and and. Uh, uh, Tara has brought up a great point, uh, just the gratitude, you know, uh, being intentional about our grat of, of this season of gratitude. That speaks volumes. It speaks volumes of, our, of the legacy of the pilgrims. It speaks volumes of our nation, and it speaks volumes to the world. So intentionally, uh, I think I'll focus a little bit on uh, being intentionally uh, with this spirit of gratitude as we gather as a family. Thank you. And the pilgrim amongst us, finally. Well, I am, Adam, tempted to read part of the scriptures, my people thirst for a lack of knowledge. Just coming out of character, though, uh, two perspectives. First is we talk about how we think of people going back. That had been raised a couple of times. What I like to do, and I've talked to a couple of my, my colleagues, is what would they think of us? If they were looking back at us from another era, particularly in American history, what would they think about what has come after them? Something that can be quite humbling. The other thing I would say, when you look at the Plymouth story, it's not in a vacuum. Too often, and many may, may agree, when we look at a piece of history, it almost like it begins and starts at its own genesis. It does not. There's a huge background behind it. On the historical portion of it, the peace treaty. One thing to keep in mind, the reason the peace treaty was signed was the Wampanoag's greatest enemy was not the English. They were the Narragansetts and other tribes in the area. The English, the settler's greatest enemy, wasn't the Wampanoag's or other tribes at that time. They were the French, the Spanish, maybe the Portuguese who appeared off the shores. And that was a mutual defense treaty. Quite often, they were called in to enlist help against the other. The other thing we, we, we deal with today, people in the education field, people in doing what we're doing, deconstructionists. 
Uh, there has been a systematic decades approach to American history to deconstruct it because we don't have the knowledge to defend it, to teach it, to learn from it, or to talk about it. And I think that's the most valuable tool I think people can, can do. Going through primary sources, go to the source. You can determine and think and, and certainly reason rather than having somebody else tell you what had happened who wasn't there. Um, and I also say the biggest thing is, you know, look at what is accomplished. What was accomplished? Quite often, a lot of the faults come from human beings and not following their own rules, not following what is in front of us. And I think that is probably the greatest lesson to take away. Just like students and, and all of us, exactly. Thank you so much, everyone, for a spirited discussion, uh, for being um, incredibly um, involved, and uh, for taking the time to do this. We know you have so many other things um, to do, and uh, most grateful in the spirit of gratitude for our educators who are dealing with unprecedented, unforeseen challenges, and um, we are rooting for you helping you along the way and hope that we um, all end up um, on the right side of this soon. And during this pandemic, just know that um, we're here if you need anything um, and if you need support. So thank you again, everyone, for joining us on Why America. We will be back to you about recordings, additional information, and about the next couple of events soon. Happy Thanksgiving. Thank you.